So when you first log into the investment dominator, you're going to see that you don't have any records in there. Um, so you'll see under your land deals, you probably have zero prospects, zero mailed, do your offer request. Everything's just going to be zeroed out here. Um, so the first thing after you enter in your company information under the customize tab is to actually get data into the program. And you get data into the program by importing it. Um, you're going to get your property list from the county following the steps that are outlined in the land profit generator course. But once you get that raw data, you're going to create what's called an import file. And I'm going to walk through how that looks and how you import it into the system in this video. So the first thing to note is uh, you can actually import land data, house data, and uh, prospect data, buyer prospect data under the buyers list um, option. So depending on what type of data you're importing, you want to first click the area, uh, the correct area. So for example, in this video, I'm going to show you how to import land data. So I'm going to click on the land deals tab first. So I can either click this green box here or up here at the very top where it says land deals. Either way, it gets me over to the land deals section. And you know it's you're in the right place because everything should look green. Um, if you see a green bar here, you know that uh, you're in the land area. It also says my land deals up here at the top. All right, so up at the top here, you're going to see an import option right here. And we're going to click on that. And uh, the first step, step one, is just going to show you the sample list. Um, and I'm going to click on that and load that. So this is just giving you the uh, a sample list, um, which contains the exact headers you're going to be using for import list. Um, and let me explain that a little bit. Um, the fields here where it says type, first name, last name, company name, email, phone, phone to, these are all header fields um, for uh, columns of information that we allow you to import. So if your county sends you some uh, a list and you have additional fields, like for example, if you're dealing with houses, you might have a, a field for uh, a pool or a garage. Uh, for land, you might have an additional field for uh, uh, situs address, things like that. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you convert them over to the field names that we are looking for in the software. So for example, if the county calls it situs address, which some counties do, uh, which is the address of the property, you want to make sure that you rename it to property address because this is the field that we allow you to import. And uh, if I go back to the investment dominator step one here, import step one, uh, there's actually a user guide article that it reference, references here. And if you pull that user guide article up, then and you scroll down a little bit, you'll see that uh, we actually required we, we only require 11 fields out of this um, out of this sample spreadsheet. Only 11 of them are required. And uh, those are the type field that's definitely required. So I'm going to just highlight this in uh, red so you can, uh, know that this one is required. Uh, this one right here, uh, the first name, it's required, um, but it only needs to have a value if the type is individual. Okay, and I'll explain that in a little bit more. But uh, for now, I'm just going to uh, make, uh, I'm going to highlight it orange here. Um, the same thing with the last name. It's required if uh, the type field is set to an individual. Again, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more here. And the same thing for the company. It's dependent on the type field. So those are required. You got to have um, these three fields right here um, in your file. But whether you whether or not you need a value in here or not depends on what you've got set on the type on the on the type. Okay. So um, now you you've got a bunch of optional fields. The ones that are not highlighted here and they say no under required, um, they're optional. So all these ones right here, we don't even need uh, in here. We don't uh, recommend that you get them. Um, they're just something that are not needed. Uh, but we do allow you to import them because uh, you may use them in some more advanced strategies. So for example, when you go back into an area that you've already worked and you're going to do um, blind offers. Uh, again, this is not something recommended in the beginning. So don't even worry about it for your first mailing. But after you are established in an area and you know the market very well, uh, Jack does talk about an advanced strategy of doing blind offers in the land profit generator. And so uh, if you're going to do that, you can import some of these optional fields 
uh, we're actually in importing the information that will be put on your offer. For now, though, we're just importing the information we need on the neutral letter, which is what we recommend that you always send out uh, when you're going into a new area. Um, and this is the letter that just asked P owners in the area, landowners in the area, um, if they're interested in selling their piece of land. All right, so moving on to the other required fields, address uh, is required. So if we go over here, I'm just going to highlight this. This one's definitely required. And it says address, but if you look over here to the um, description of it, you can see that this is the, the value description right here. It should contain the street address of the owner. All right, so this is like the mailing address of the owner right here. And then we've got the city. This is also part of the uh, mailing address of the owner. I'm going to highlight that. We've got state, zip, and APN. Uh, so state, zip, APN, these are all required. Now, APN stands for assessor's parcel number. In some counties, uh, this is called just a parcel number or an assessment number or an assessor's number. Uh, sometimes they even call it an account number. But basically what this is is the unique identifying number for that property in the county. It's a county number. You're going to get it from the county list. Um, and it's it's unique to the property. So uh, whatever they call it in your county, uh, like I said, typically it's referenced as an APN or a partial number. But if it uh, but if it's not called that, just ask the county what they uh, what number they use to identify uh, and dif differentiate properties in their county. What is unique to a property? All right. So now we we got um, you know some optional fields like I mentioned before. Here we've got like property address, which is the same as a situs address. It would be the address of a property. And the reason we have it as an optional field is because most vacant land does not have an address, not a proper address anyways. It might have like a street number or something associated with it, but because it's vacant land, it's not going to have a proper address like a house would. Because um, so, a lot of times you're dealing with property that hasn't yet had a a building permit filed on it. So you might see something in there like some street names, maybe some street number ranges. Those are not very accurate. We don't usually import this or recommend that you import it, but you could if you wanted to um, to reference it. Uh, it is not like houses where you always have an address. Uh, so this is definitely an optional field. If you don't have any addresses for the property, don't worry. That's a very common scenario and we don't import any addresses. Um, so. Uh, I'll just leave this uh, as unhighlighted because you don't actually need it. The one that I would, um, if you do have the information in your list, I would import and it's also an optional field. But if you do have it, I do recommend that you uh, try to import the property zip code. Um, this is just going to help you out um, in your comping. It'll, it'll make your comping um, uh, research faster. Uh, if you have already the property zip codes loaded in there. And so if the county provides you with property zip codes, go ahead and import it, even though it's an optional list, uh, optional field uh, to import. Uh, but you still you got to have the property county and the property state. These are absolutely required. So I'm going to highlight those property county, property state. These are absolutely required. I'm going to highlight them in red. And then um, and that's it. Now you notice that the required fields equal 11 fields. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Those 11 fields are absolutely required. Um, everything else is just optional. And like I said, if you have the property zip code, I would go ahead and enter it. If not, just leave that off as well. But now for all the other fields that we're not going to use, all the optional ones, you can just go ahead and delete those off of your list. So I'm just going to highlight the columns and I'm going to delete them off the list here. And uh, we'll just keep the ones that are required. And uh, well, I'll keep the tag one in there for a second and we'll just explain about that one. So all these other ones right here, I'm just going to go ahead and delete. Okay, so we've got our 11 required fields. We have our property zip code. Now the tags, how tags work is that you, let's say you have a, a large list from the county and you want to split the, you don't want to segment the list in some shape or manner, or you want to track the people in the list over time. So let's say that um, you want to track uh, properties that are in some kind of a subdivision separately from the ones that are in a rural area. You could use what's called a tag. Um, and, and if you look through the user guide, uh, do a search for tags, 
you'll bring up a, a user guide article about uh, how, how to create tags and how to use it. But I just want to mention in this video that you can import, um, when you import your, uh, your list, you can also just go ahead and tag them at that time. And so this is very helpful if you want to, like, like I said, do some reporting later on to see how many you know people responded from, let's say, an infill area versus a rural area. Um, you, won't, you won't easily be able to find that information unless you tag them separately. So a good way to do it is to kind of think of that ahead of time be, you know, while you're creating the import list and then import that data. And you can actually have multiple tags per property. So let's say that uh, property is uh, going to be tagged as a uh, infill lot and then it's also tagged as a, um, let's see, if you're tracking different areas, you might have another tag for, uh, let's say, uh, um, high value uh, properties, okay? And then in this one, you might just have that it's in an infill, uh, infill lot. So this is an example of a record that has multiple tags. You can see that it, uh, it's delimited. Uh, each tag is delimited by a pipe symbol, uh, a space, a pipe, and a space. And that tells the system to tag this record um, with three tags and then tag this other record just with one tag. Okay, so that's kind of how the tag um, column works. I'm just going to go ahead and delete this for now. Uh, so uh, let me explain a little bit more about individual and company, the, the, the type column here. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up a sample list. Okay, so this is a list from a sample county, and you'll notice that we have the 11 required fields. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger here so you can see that. But we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Uh, we have 11 required fields. And you'll notice this type column right here. Now, for an individual person, you can see an individual needs a first and a last name. That should make sense um, that a person has a first and a last name. But when you get down to a company record, I'm going to come down here to one that's uh, designated as a company. You can see that the type is set to company, and a company doesn't have, if it doesn't have a care of person, it won't have a first and last name. Um, so therefore, it needs a company name. So under the company column, if we go to the top here, this column right here is a company column. Uh, you can see that for an individual, it's blank. But as you get down to the company column, uh, you'll see the name of the actual company in this column uh, called company. I know that sounds redundant, but uh, but hopefully that makes sense. Uh, individuals have first and last names. Companies do not have any first and last names, but they do have a company name. Now, when I say company, I also mean trusts, um, like this one right here. Uh, I also mean sometimes banks are in there, churches are in there. Uh, basically, any entity that doesn't have a first and a last name or a contact person. If it has a contact person, you want to mark it as an individual and put the first name and last name of that contact person. The other one thing that I want to mention is for an individual is if you do want to include a first and last name, but it's owned by like a married couple, then you could put the two first names in there uh, in the word and. So in this case, Roosevelt and Jeanette uh, Macon is in here, and you can see that both the first names are in the first name column, uh, and then their same last name. So now if, um, if somebody owns the property with, let's say, their brother and sister or partner, and they have two different last names, then you only want to select one of the owners. Because again, we're not generating a offer based on this. We're generating a letter. And so if a property is owned jointly by multiple people, um, and you contact the first person on the list, then it's still going to get to somebody. That person, when they call you, they're going to say, you know, it's owned by by multiple people. Uh, but regardless of whether they notify you of that or not when they call in, when you get to the pending preliminary research stage, which is the, the stage right before you make the offer, you're actually going to pull the exact owner ownership information from the county. And at that time, you're going to be able to get all of the names of the people on title. 
in the beginning, you don't need that. You just need one contact person to call you back. So if you have a scenario where there's multiple people on title, just pick the first one on there, put their first name under the first name column, their last name under the last name column, and, uh, and leave it at that. Um, and if it's owned by a company or a trust and, and there's multiple care of people, just uh, index it as a company and put the name of the trust under the company field. All right, the other thing I wanna point out is that you'll notice that all of the data is in a proper case. All of our headers are in proper case, meaning it's not all in uppercase or lowercase. It has the first character of the value is always capitalized and the rest is lowercase. So this is very important to do, not only in the headers, they need to match exactly how it is displayed in uh, the field name column on this user guide article um, and also in the sample file provided to you. Uh, they need to uh, be called exactly this. So for example, if you do these uh, column names all in uppercase uh, capital letters, it's not gonna be the same as uh, actually using the proper case value of first name. So the same goes for the actual data of the, each records. Um, sometimes I see that um, the address or city or names of the uh, owners are in all capital, are all capitalized, they're all in uppercase. You always want to make sure that they were in the proper case, just as you would write a letter to somebody, they're in that case. So in this case, it's, you know, uh, a proper case name, the address in proper case. Um, the only thing that's in all caps is the state, which is a proper thing to do. Um, and so it's all capitalized here. But I want to point that out because if sometimes the county doesn't provide it to you in a, a format that is in proper case, and you're going to have to um, work with your data processor, or if you know Excel, you know, use some of the built-in Excel parameters to actually clean that up prior to you importing it into the system. The other thing that I want to point out to, and, and you can look this up in the user guide, is how to properly format a zip code field and your APNs. Both of these fields are typically overwritten and reformatted automatically by uh, Excel because Excel is a financial program. It doesn't really like zip codes. So you, what you have to do is explicitly tell Excel that, you, that your zip code field is a zip code field. And the way to do that is you highlight the column, right click, and then you're gonna click on format cells. And then you're going to select where it says special and then zip code. This will tell um, Excel that uh, you wanna explicitly format this column as a zip code column. And what that's going to do is make sure that if there's a leading zero uh, in the zip code, which, are, which is the case in some states, that uh, it retains that. Um, you'll notice if you don't, if you skip this part of it, um, your zip codes, if, if it contains a leading zero, Excel will drop that uh, because it doesn't understand that, that it's a five digit zip code number. The next thing is the uh, APN. If, if your APNs have a lot of zeros in it um, and no dashes and no um, letters in it, then you're probably going to have to format the APN uh, column as well. And what you wanna do is you wanna right click, you want to format the cells and you wanna um, format that as a text column, and you click OK, and that will format it properly. Before you save it, just go ahead and give your list a once over, make sure you have the 11 required fields, make sure all of the 11 required fields are uh, have some kind of value in it, except for the first name, last name, and company, which basically is dependent upon what type you use. So it is perfectly okay to have a blank value under company when the type is set to individual, and it's perfectly okay to have a blank value under uh, first name and last name if the type is set to company. Uh, for all the other 11 required fields, you must have a value. And let me point something out to you. If I scroll down through my list, I actually have a couple of mistakes in here, and I wanna point them out to you. You can see row 39 will not create properly because there's a mistake that's happened here. I do not have a last name. Um, and the first name is kind of messed up in this case. Um, so when the system creates, tries to create uh, record 39, it's going to come, it's going to actually display an error for row 39. Um, and I'll show you that, how that looks like in a minute. 
but uh, it's going to actually give us the row 39 here, and it's going to tell us that we're missing some information. But this is the thing that we're going to be missing. Uh, if I scroll down to another record here, we've got row 46 is going to have an issue. Again, there's no last name. This is required because I set the record to an individual, so it's looking for a last name in this case. Um, if I scroll down, I might have a few other uh, issues with this, but what I'm going to show you is that when you import this into the investment dominator, it's going to tell you, uh, you know, what what has problems and what got created uh, perfectly fine. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about here is how to save this file. You're going to want to come up here to where it says File, and then you're going to click on Save As, and where it says uh, CSV, you want to make sure because sometimes it says Excel X. But what you want to do is you want to actually click down here where it says CSV comma delimited CSV. A couple things I want to point out to you in Excel is that Excel has different CSV formats. You can see up here there's one called CSV UTF-8. Okay, and this is also a CSV file, but this is not the one that uh, the investment dominator reads. The one that's a properly formatted as a CSV is the one that says CSV comma delimited uh, CSV, dot CSV. So when I select this one, this is actually the, the, the file type that you're going to want to use in order to create a list that is going to be importable in the investment dominator. So go ahead and save your file as that. All right, so going back to the investment dominator here, once we've got the step one done, which is basically formatting our county list into a proper format, we're going to go ahead and import it. Now, when you import a brand new list, you're going to just kind of keep the defaults in place, which is uh, by default, we have create new records selected. And by default, we move all those new records that are being created into the prospect status. And there is a good reason why we do this. It's because we want to generate a neutral letter for every one of these new prospects that we're, we're uh, importing into the system. And the only way to do that on a bulk scale is to import them as prospects. Um, later on in other videos and tutorials, we'll show you why you might want to import them into other statuses. But when you're brand new into the system, you always kind of want to keep everything the default um, settings. And by default, we put it into the prospect status on purpose so that it's the easiest way to generate your list, uh, your neutral letters, and you can get your mailing out the fastest. So keep it on. Uh, create new records, keep it on prospect uh, on the prospect status, which is the recommended one. And then you're right down here where it says choose your file, you're going to click on choose your file. And here is where you're going to find your file that uh, you just created, your .csv file that's uh, that you formatted for the investment dominator. In this case, the file that I had was showing was this one right here. And so I'm going to select that file and I'm going to click open to load it. Now you'll see right here the name of the file is actually displayed kind of in the center of this uh, section here. And uh, then I'm going to hit the upload list button to upload that file. Once I hit that, it's going to load. And now you'll see that I, it gave me two errors. One is says empty last name in row 39 in row 46. And if you remember from just a few minutes ago when we were actually looking at the list ourselves, we had a missing uh, last name for those two rows. So at this point, we could go back and we could fix that in our .csv file and then re-import it and then create those missing two records. Or we can just know that those two records didn't get created. It's really up to you. Now, a couple other things that I want to point out to you is the fact that it says that um, 167 uh, new owners were created. Now, there is a differentiation between uh, owners and properties, and I want to make that clear here. So uh, owners are obviously represents the owner of the property. It's uh, a unique owner is uh, designated by their address. So um, if a property, if you have multiple um, uh, records in your property list from the county, uh, but the multiple records are owned by a single owner, then what you'll find is that the commonality in the owner part of the record is the address, okay? So uh, the, uh, the, the owner lives at a certain location. So the investment dominator looks for that. It looks to see how many 
people in your list have a duplicate address. And it does not want to create a duplicate owner address. So instead of creating duplicate owners, it creates one owner record for, for that person. So in this case, this line down here said that there were uh, 10 ex existing owner records. This means that out of the 160 uh, uh, or 177 uh, records, 10 of these um, were actually owned by an owner that owned multiple properties, okay? And what the system did was only create one record for that owner, and then it attached the properties, all the properties that that owner owned to their record, okay? So if the owner owned two properties, then it would have one owner record and two property records, but the two property records would be attached to the one owner record. Um, and same thing if the property owner owned five properties, then all five property records are gonna be attached to one owner record. It doesn't create multiple owner records in that case, okay? Uh, now, when it comes down here, it says, uh, you know, properties added 177. So uh, what that means, and there was, uh, there was zero existing uh, property records. What these two lines mean is that the system went through and it looked at the APN number, which again is the parcel number of the property, which should be unique um, to the property. Um, and it actually looks at the APN the property county and the property state combination, because for example, if you if your if your list contains properties in, in more than one county, it is possible that multiple counties have properties in there that that share a common parcel number, right? Because each county is independent of each other; they they are managed independently of each other, so they don't share a common database, and so. Um, so when we are checking your property records, we're actually checking it against the APN, the property county, and the property state combination. And if it's unique, we will create that property record. If it's not unique, then we will not create that property record. And if you do not have a unique property record, then you'll actually see a number here. In this case, uh, in my list, in my sample list, all of my property records were unique. I didn't have any kind of a duplication in property records. And so that's why it says zero um, existing properties. Um, but I will let you know, for example, if you re-import, like I was saying earlier, um, I said that if you fixed row 39 and 46 in your list and you re-import, you'll notice that this, uh, the, next, the second time that you import, uh, you'll get a bunch of duplicate properties because um, it's not going to create um, or recreate the 177 records that you already created. It'll only create the two that uh, are now qualified to be created, if that makes sense. So um, if you import this same exact list with, um, you know, the last names filled in for properties 39 and 46, what you'll see is in that case, on that second import, you'll see 177 uh, existing properties and two properties added. That's how it will look. Now this log right here, if in case you hit the back button by accident and you move away from this and then you wonder um, how do you get back to that screen of that uh, overview, you can actually pull that up under the activity log. And again, the activity log is found under the My Team uh, tab and under where it says Activity Log. And under the activity log, you'll see that there's a record created that um, under your username that you added a bunch of records by importing them. Okay, if you hover over this little help thing, you'll see the actual ID ranges of the records that were created. And if you click detail, it actually brings up the uh, import um, activity that we were just looking at previously. So if you, again, if you had gone away from that and you want to bring that up again, you can always access it through the activity log. And then you can see here exactly what happened when you did that import.